Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Bridget Farah from the Metallurgy and Materials Society of CIM. Today's webinar is titled Integrated Mining and Processing Systems Design for Eco-Efficiency. This is presented by Laurie Remayer of Resourceful Pass. So to begin with, before we start, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, to ensure that you have optimal audio quality, if you joined us with your computer, ensure that you selected the computer button that you see as seen on my screen. Likewise, if you joined us with a traditional telephone, make sure that the phone button is selected. So at any time during this webinar today, if you have a question, you can simply write it in in this question box that you see on your control panel. This can include anything regarding the presentation or any technical questions. So today I'm not alone. I'm joined with Nolene Ahern of Barry Gold Corporation. She's the technical chair of the environment section. And of course, I am joined today with Lori Remayer, our esteemed panelist. So Lori, I'm going to transfer presentation to you. Okay. Thank you, Bridget. Okay. Thanks very much for joining us today. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about systems design for mining projects, and we're going to talk about eco-efficiency, which is really about how we can reduce the environmental impact for a given unit of output and profit from mining projects. We know that mining faces major challenges uh, at the moment. Some of those include declining grades and deepening ore bodies, which are driving up costs and increasing the amount of wastes. Waste management is a big challenge because of geotechnical failures of certain waste facilities, as well as water-related problems such as acid rock drainage. In many parts of the world, mines are in, in water-scarce areas where there's competition for water from other users, such as for irrigation, for agriculture and communities, and there's a cost to secure supplies of, of scarce water. Climate change can be a problem because it, it can potentially affect mines through extreme weather events such as flooding and landslides, as well as the costs of future emissions control to control greenhouse gas emissions. There's social unrest in certain parts of the world with water-related conflicts or community dislocation. And also mines are facing challenges with financial viability, especially for mega projects where there's been big increases in capital costs and the costs of major environmental incidents. So mines, big mines can have big failures. This is an example from the Kennecott, Utah mine in, in Utah near Salt Lake City in 2013, where about 150 million tonnes of material slipped off the side of the mine, buried a whole lot of the mining fleet. It caused ma major production loss. Thankfully, there was no loss of life or injury because there was monitoring. But this is an example of how major mines can have major failures. In addition, we have catastrophic tailings failures. Typically, we have one or two of these around the world every year. There's two examples here, one from South Africa in 1994, one from Mount Polly Mine in British Columbia in 2014. And these type of events can cause major problems and damage to surrounding communities and the environment. And shareholders also can lose billions of dollars when mining projects go wrong. A couple of examples include the Minas Rio mine from Anglo-American where billions of dollars were written off and also the Barrack Pascualama mine in South America near the border of Chile and Argentina where many billions of dollars were written off and the mine still is not in production. And this is often due to environmental challenges as well as other, other challenges in the mining process. So some key questions that we can ask ourselves is how can we design mining and processing systems that have less impact while staying economically viable? How can we avoid catastrophic failures in mining projects, whether they be environmental, social or economic? How can we make the best of the geological and geographical attributes and constraints of deposits? And how can we innovate successfully to implement more eco-efficient systems? So when we think about a mining project, the, the mining, the processing, it's really an interacting series of components. We have the mine excavations themselves where we're digging out the, the, the ore. We have the processing, which includes things such as the crushing, grinding, what we call comminution. 
uh, and the separation processes such as flotation and leaching and the dewatering of the of the mine waste materials and 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 tailings we have waste management facilities such as waste rock and tailings we have the water management facilities which include the water supply storage diversion and treatment we have materials handling systems that connect all these things whether it's waste rock or products to market and we have other services such as power we need to consider the engineering and economics of putting all those components together within environmental and social constraints and what we find in mining projects is it's, it's the mining method and the process design that drive the ore cutoff grade and then the quantities of both ore and waste, the characteristics of the waste and the site layout, all those things need to fit together. So I like to think about the three geos. We've got geology, geometry and geography. And these are very important factors which influence what a mining project is going to look like. So the geology includes things such as the structures in which the mineral deposits are placed, it's so the minerals that are present, including how they associate with one another and what their grain size is, and that's both for valuable minerals as well as gang and waste minerals, and those things can influence the environmental impacts that come from the wastes. And geology affects what are the feasible extraction options, such as if we can process a copper ore by um, leaching or, or concentration because of its oxide or sulphide nature. The geometry relates to the shape of the deposit and that ties very closely to the selection of the mining methods such as open pit or underground. It, it in, includes things such as geomechanics and it affects the location of mine access relative to the other facilities. Geography is important. It includes topography, which influences where we can put our waste deposits. It includes the weather, which affects the site water management regional geography, which includes things such as the access to water and the transport logistics, access to power and so forth, and the political geography, which influences the regulatory requirements, the surrounding stakeholders and how much power they have over a mining project. Mining methods, we have two main methods. Firstly, open pit, which can generate large amounts of waste rock. We're digging there from the surface and we have to uncover the ore body and place that waste rock in the dumps or underground methods, both bulk methods such as caving methods or selective methods such as cut and fill, which will depend on the geometry of the deposit. The mining method is usually defined by the spatial orientation of the resources relative to the surface. And the mining uh, method will determine how much ore can be recovered, what the dilution is, and that affects what we call the cutoff grade, which is the economic limit uh, that we can mine out to still make money. It's often influenced by the experience and preferences, both of the designer and the owner, what they perceive to be low risk, what they're familiar with. The choice of equipment size affects the selectivity of the ore mining. For example, if we're going for a cheap and bulk method, we'll tend to get more waste dilution into the ore stream. Another thing that needs to be considered at mines is the potential transition from open pit to underground mining. If that's planned, that can have a big impact on the overall footprint of the operation. With respect to processing technologies, generally those technologies are chosen for high recovery, for low cost and for sound environmental attributes. And if we want to improve eco-efficiency, some things that can be considered is, is the process energy and water efficient? Does it use low quantities of energy and water? Do we use non-toxic reagents? And can we produce relatively what benign waste products? And can we reduce the quantities of waste that we produce? With respect to the, the comminution and separation, there are things we can do to improve eco-efficiency. For example, mine to mill, mill blasting optimization, which can help minimise energy consumption per tonne of ore. We can use technologies such as high pressure grinding rolls, HPGR, which is energy efficient for certain hard ore types and can also improve extraction in certain heat leaching operations. We can also optimise the grind size and classification in separation. We can use techniques such as pre-concentration and coarse particle flotation. These things can reduce the energy intensity of mining processes. On the leaching side, there are emerging technologies such as the Albion process. It's an atmospheric leaching technology which can have less energy intensity. We can focus on things like leaching and stabilising contaminants such as arsenic, 
from base metal and gold ores and concentrates. That's very important because we need to form benign waste products for that arsenic that don't leach into waters. And in some cases, we can generate and recycle excipients from spent liquors or gas streams. An example of this is sulfuric acid recovery from smelter gases to avoid pollution and to generate a useful input into a separation process. With all of the processing technologies, it's very important that we do test work to ensure the suitability for a given or mineralogy and chemistry of the system. We're going to go to a poll question, Bridget. Perfect. Okay, everyone. So here's your poll question. What do you believe is the biggest area of environmental exposure facing the mining industry? So each of you attendees, please select an answer. Is it water scarcity, water pollution, tailings dam failures, climate change, or surface footprint? So please make your selection. So we'll give a a few seconds for people to vote. I see more than 50 people, 50% 50 voted. Here we are. Mm, anybody else? Okay, here we go. I will close and I will share the results. So the results uh, overwhelmingly is 39% for water pollution. Back to you. All right, thank you. Well, water certainly is a very big issue in mining, and that's both scarcity as well as water pollution. So we'll start talking about reducing freshwater use in mining operations. So in base metals and precious metals mining operations that have milling circuits, the majority of the overall water consumption at a mine site relates to the tailings, the waste products that are produced from that milling operation. And the water may be trapped in the pores of the tailings or it may evaporate from the beaches in the pond or in uncaptured seepage. We can use more intensive water dewatering of tailings to improve water recycling. That can include things such as paste thickening, filtration, or designing the tailings facility to maximise the amount of water reclaim, and that can reduce the cubic metres per tonne of, uh, of water consumption. If we increase head grade, we can also reduce the tailings production per unit of metal, which in turn reduces water consumption. In some parts of the world, there's also been a trend to switch from fresh water to lower quality waters, such as sea waters or saline groundwaters. And some examples of that are copper and gold operations in Chile, Australia and Indonesia that use seawater and some operations in Peru, Australia and South Africa that use either retreated sewerage water or acid drain, rock drainage affected waters in those processes. The use of low quality water is very ore specific. It's also commodity and unit operations specific. So we need to consider things such as corrosion and the effects on the metallurgical separation. And in some cases, we may need to take some bleed streams out of the process and treat them to avoid the buildup of contaminants, or we might need to modify reagent schemes. We can understand water intensity in mining through a driver tree. And this is an example for a copper operation. We have two branches to the tree. The bottom branch includes the production, which comes from how much ore is processed times the head grade times the recovery. And on the top tree, we have the water consumption, which is driven by the amount of ore processed and a specific water use in megalitres per tonne of ore. So if we want to reduce the water intensity, firstly, we can look at how much ore is processed, and that is inversely proportional to the head grade for a given unit of copper production. So increasing head grade means less ore processed per unit of copper, less water. We can also do things to reduce specific water use through the selection of the process flow sheet and managing things such as tailings dewatering and evaporation, which we talked about earlier. Water use in copper mining in Chile 2015 is shown in this table here. We see there's two types of ores and processes that are used. We've got the concentrator process, which is mainly for sulphide ores. We have leaching and SXCWs for oxide and supergene ores. When we look at this table, the main thing that stands out is that the water intensity per tonne of ore is much lower for leaching and salt extraction than it is for the concentrated process. That's because 
the concentrator generates tailings that lose a lot of water. Overall, the intensity in cubic metres of water per tonne of copper is still lower for leaching, but there's lower head grades and lower recoveries for those type of ores. So if you think about some of the things that we can do to reduce overall water intensity, is it possible to increase the head grade by shifting towards underground mines? That's happening in some places in Chile as older open pits move towards underground methods. Can we change tailing practices to drop the specific water consumption in metres cubed per tonne of ore, what we talked about earlier? For leaching in S60W, can we increase leach extractions from 55 to something higher? That would reduce the amount of water per tonne of copper produced because we'd be making more copper from a particular quantity of ore processed. Can we move some production from the concentrator process to the leach in S60W process? which has a lot lower water intensity. And then also, is there possibility to substitute fresh water with seawater? So all of these techniques can be used to reduce water efficient water consumption in copper mines and move towards more eco-efficient practices. I now want to turn to the topic of pre-concentration. And this is a technique where we separate liberated gang or low-grade material from an ore stream by various techniques. These can include screening or sorting, dense medium separation, et cetera. And this is really a balancing act where we're trying to look at how effectively can we reject rejects without losing too much metal? And what's the cost of putting in such a processing facility versus the gain that comes from a higher head grade feeding the downstream processes, generation of less tailings, less water and energy use, and potentially lower overall operating cost. And this needs to be assessed on a case by case basis. If we look at the value drivers for pre-concentration, firstly, looking at costs. So by rejecting low-grade particles from North Stream, we reduce process operating costs in grinding, lower power, lower steel media consumption. There's a potential benefit by decoupling mining method and processing, and that may allow us to shift the cutoff grade and may allow us to optimise the overall costs because the mining method no longer has to be as focused about dilution. You have another chance to get rid of some of the waste materials that's in the ore stream. And pre-concentration can also help minimise the transport costs for satellite deposits where we have to, for example, truck or from a satellite deposit to a main processing plant. We need to consider the revenue changes when we do pre-concentration and generally it will be economically viable if we can reject at least 30% of the material in the ore stream with less than 5% metal loss. We should consider the potential for debottlenecking a plant by rejecting low grade material, increasing the head grade. And if we can operate at a tonnage constraint, that means higher overall metal production while we're using that pre-concentration. Now, pre-concentration will potentially reduce the mine life. That can be mitigated in part by reprocessing the reject stream at the end of the mine life, you can have another chance of recovering things uh, once you've paid off your asset. There's also potentially environmental benefits from using pre-concentration. These include segregating sulphide particles to reduce and better manage acid rock drainage. We can also reduce the amount of tailings production when not grinding as much material, and that's important where the tailing storage capacity is constrained or where there's environmental challenges of storing tailings on surface, and also water consumption because we're generating less tailings, we'll use less water. Here's an example of ore sorting. That's one of the pre-concentration techniques. There's two types, particle sorting or bulk sorting. There are various sensors that can be used, such as X-ray transmittance, X-ray fluorescence, colour, etc. When we're doing particle sorting, as, as per this picture on the right, we can use air jets or paddles to divert particles either into a waste stream or into a, a valuable stream. And that is commonly used in diamonds and industrial mineral separation. If we're doing bulk sorting, what we tend to do is we use a batch diversion of a parcel of material into either a waste or a stockpile material. And that can be done either using shovels such as the MindSense shovel sense technology or through diverting material on conveyors. There are minimal commercial examples of bulk sorting at this stage, whereas particle sorting is more widely used. So the key 
Keys to success in pre-concentration, if we're doing bulk sorting, it's very important to look at the spatial heterogeneity. What you're trying to do is take parcels of material that have low or higher grades to put them in different places. So we need to look at that. We need accurate and timely diversion of those material parcels to the correct stream. If we're looking at particle sorting or separation, there needs to be sufficient liberation or breaking free of gang minerals from valuable minerals to ensure that we can do a proper and selective separation on the basis of the, the, the parameter that's being used to do that separation, whether it's size or density or something else. It's also very important that the particles are presented to the separation process correctly to allow efficient separation and that there's good process control. In all of this, it's very important to integrate the breakage circuits, the comminution circuits, and the materials handling systems with the pre-concentration to make sure that the overall system is operable and low cost. And testing is also very important to ensure that it's viable so that when you make the investment in pre-concentration, it actually delivers the value that you expected. I now want to turn to reducing tailings risks. So as we know, there are major tailings failures they can cause catastrophic damage. We have some pictures from the uh, Fundal, that's the Samarco failure that happened in Brazil in 2015. So some of the things we can do, we can lower the risk of failure by producing more stable embankments, so no upstream dam construction. So we can see in the middle picture on the right, that was the, the type of dam that was used in Samarco. It's an upstream, a type of upstream raise. Those are inherently less stable and have greater potential of failure. So using either centre line or downstream construction rather than upstream. We can minimise the water storage on inner TSF and that reduces the failure consequence. That was a factor in the Mount Polly failure. There was a lot of water in the dam that made the failure worse. We can do more intensive tailings dewatering, which we talked about earlier. And a key thing to recognise there is that when we're doing paste thickening or filtration, coarser grind sizes help dewatering. They also save more energy. We can reduce the size of the tailing storage facilities. We talked about pre-concentration to divert some of the material in the ore stream so we don't generate as much ground tailings. We can also divert some ore to other techniques such as dump leaching. We can use backfill, backfill either underground paste backfill or placing tailings into mined out open pits to reduce the quantities of material that need to be stored in tailings facilities on the surface. We can also increase the density of deposition, which is linked to dewatering. Here are some pictures of different tailings methods. On the left, we have examples of classification where we're taking sand material out of the tailings to build embankments. In the middle, there's an example of a paste thickener. So we generate a viscous uh, product which doesn't flow as easily and is also more dense and doesn't take up as much room. And then on the right, we have filtration, which can be used uh, in some cases to generate more stable tailings facilities. And we need to think when we're doing the tailing system design about how the dewatering, the classification and the transport all fit together. In terms of filtration, dry stacking of tailings, that's where we take tailings, we filter them either using pressure filtration or vacuum filtration, typically to around 15% moisture. It will depend on the specific tailings material. The filtrate water is recycled. In some cases, we can recycle reagents as well in that filtrate, such as cyanide, and that's used in some gold processes for this reason. The water recovery, the water recovered from the filtration reduces the makeup water requirements. By doing filtration and dry stacking, we remove the need for a tailings embankment the operating cost, it doesn't come for free. It's typically around two to four dollars per tonne, but the cost decrease for coarser tailings, and it needs to be considered as part of the overall system, both of looking at how this reduces risk and reduces footprint, et cetera. We need to determine what's the right placement of the process plant filters, dry stack, and how we move the material to the dry stack, for example, using conveyors and, tr and trucks. That's very important when we're trying to find a dry stack design that works. It may be combined with paste backfill for underground mines. Often we need to do some filtration to produce the right 
consistency of paste for backfill into mines. And the testing of filtration is really critical to make sure that we achieve the right capacity and we characterise the tailings properly for the dry stack. Here's an example of dry stack from Mexico. This is the Torex El Limon Guacas mine. It's a 14,000 tonne per day gold leaching mine that uses pressure filtration and conveys the material to the dry stack. We can also consider options to lower the risks from wastes. And there's usually two types of risks we've talked about, geotechnical risks such as a tailings dam failure and water contamination risks such as acid rock drainage or a cyanide release. One way of managing these risks is to mix complementary materials. So if we want to address geotechnical risks, we can, for example, commingle the fine tailings with the waste rock to create a mixture that has low permeability and better geotechnical properties. And this, for example, is the gold core geo-waste concept that's being trialled at the Penasquito mine. We can also think about managing ARD risks by mixing complementary materials from a neutralisation potential point of view, a limestone bearing material with a potentially acid generating material. Segregation may be used to segregate the material that has potential acid generation and store it more uh, safely in a particular repository. We can talk about backfill, uh, previously we've talked about backfill, and it's important that we integrate site water management with the waste management, in particular water diversion and minimising the amount of water that gets in contact with waste to minimise water contamination. So we can see that these are, for example, elements, building blocks to produce a, a lower risk mine. Uh, we've got underground mining, tailings filtration, paste backfill, co-disposal. These things can fit together to come up with a, a mine that has much lower risk with respect to tailings and lower footprint. I now want to turn to the topic of integrated design process. This is a concept that comes out of the building industry and this table comes from the BC Green Building Round Table in 2007. And it compares an integrated design process versus a conventional design process. So the integrated process focuses on being inclusive, ensuring that decisions are made broadly by the team, that there's a lot of effort put in upfront to look at options and to look at a whole systems an optimised solution for a particular problem, as opposed to only involving people when it's deemed necessary and trying to limit the amount of decision making and collaboration. Integrated design can be used at mining, it's typically not. We, we generally follow a more conventional design process. And so in mining, that's typically geologists defining resource, the mining engineer selecting a mining method of, and applying economic constraints then the processing people just determining a flow sheet and working out the recovery and the cost factors. And then waste management is usually an afterthought. It's like, here's the tailings of waste we're gonna generate. You guys deal with it, get it permitted. So an integrated approach would consider the environmental aspects in conjunction with the mine and the process design. That would include things related to tailings, water, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. And some mining companies moving in this direction. It's very important that we consider the structure of the owners and consulting teams to allow an integrated process to work, but that needs to ensure that there's effective collaboration across disciplines. Here is an example of an integrated system for an underground mine where the various elements end up working together to reduce footprint, reduce water use, etc. What we have is the underground mine potentially ore sorting and pre-concentration to re recycle the reject stream back into the into the stokes and backfill. We transport the ore to the processing facility. We generate concentrate, which goes to market. The tailings may be segregated to separate out the sulphide bearing material, put that underground in paste backfill with some of the non-site sulphide tailings. The dewatered tailings that are, that are left are stored in the tailings storage facility on surface. And the paste backfill that's tailings combined with binder to go back into the Stopes underground. So it reduces the input. It reduces the footprint of material stored on surface. Water is recycled from the dewatering operations. And overall, we end up with a system that has relatively low impact. It's an eco-efficient system. We can look at the metrics of comparing an open pit versus an underground a system then. This underground system has backfill incorporated into it. And we just compare these two. These are two 
mines that would be producing about the same amount of copper, just under 100,000 tonnes per year. And what you can see is that the open pit generates a large amount of waste rock. Because it's a low grade mine, it's generating a lot of tailings. Um, it uses a lot of water. In the underground case, much of the tailings go to the paste backfill underground. So there's limited tailings stored on surface. There's very little waste rock. And overall metrics are that we have a lot less water use for the underground mine. We have a lot less greenhouse gas emissions because of less diesel and electricity used in the mining and processing facilities. So the winner, the green mine, is the underground mine. It has much better eco-efficiency. Some examples of integrated design. So the Pogo Gold Mine in Alaska, that's a high-grade underground mine that uses grinding, gravity and flotation, concentrate leaching, and then it takes the waste materials, it puts, um, it filters the, the waste materials. Some of that is returned underground as paste backfill, including all the cyanide impacted tailings, and then a small portion is placed as, as filtered tailings in a dry stack on surface. So this is a very low footprint mine, and that's the top picture in Alaska there. The Los Bronches mine in Chile, that's an example where there was space restrictions at the at the mine site. It's up in the mountains. It's this picture on the bottom right. And by splitting the processing, both they were able to, to place the facilities in that restricted footprint. They also could do safer tailings disposal down the valley, and they had less water to pump to the processing facilities up in the mountains, saving money and saving environmental impact. The Centinella copper gold mine in Chile, that uses seawater processing and high density tailings thickening to maximise water recycling and the energy input for water transport to the mine site. And then the Kansanshi copper gold mine in Zambia, which has mixed uh, sulphide and oxide ore and uses sulfuric acid generated from the smelting of the sulphide concentrates into the leaching of oxide ore. I want to talk about underground innovations. So some underground mines face unique challenges. These include the geothermal gradient, so rocks and mine water get hotter as we go deeper. There are ventilation requirements due to both diesel particulates from the machinery in the underground mine, as well as heat. And there are challenges around ground support and stability. On the ventilation, it's possible to think about fleet and ventilation optimization together. If we switch from diesel to electric mine equipment, we can reduce contaminants and heat loads, which requires less ventilation. There's a technology called ventilation on demand, which is really focused on maintaining good quality air and correct temperature conditions where it's needed in the mine. By automating a mine, we can further reduce ventilation needs because we can eliminate people from certain sections of the mine potentially. And the net result is a ventilation system that has lower power consumption, lower operating cost and lower capital cost. And this can lead us towards low carbon footprint mines, such as the, the Borden mine in Ontario, which is looking at energy efficiency, electrification of its fleet and the use of renewables to greatly reduce emissions. There's also potential in some cases to do geothermal energy recovery from mine water, either as power or as heat, such as the Cerro Blanco mine in Guatemala. And in addition to all that, the pace backfall that we talked about earlier provides ground support, which can maximise ore recovery. So we can see examples in underground where we can generate much more eco-efficient mines. So where this is all leading is that there are ways for us to challenge the, there are ways for us to solve some of the challenges that mining faces. So when we talk about declining ore grades and deepening ore bodies, we can find and mine high grade underground deposits. We can use techniques such as pre-concentration and efficient process circuits. With waste management, we can move away from wet tailings, we can use commingling, and we can shift to underground mining with backfill. Water shortage, we can increase the head grades through mining methods, we can reduce the ore throughput, and we can do more tailings to watering, as well as switching from freshwater to seawater. Climate change, by making smaller footprint operations, those are less susceptible to damage from extreme weather events, they will also lower emissions, and we can use renewable energy inputs to reduce emissions. Social unrest is, is helped by smaller footprint mines, for example, moving to underground and reducing consumption of fresh water in the region. And financial viability by sharing infrastructure, by moving towards higher head grade mines, et cetera, we can also reduce the potential risk associated with mining mega projects, as well as reducing the risk of potential catastrophic failures. 
So in terms of that, we can see that there potentially are future goals for mining where we move towards target zero incidents from safety, where we move from primarily surface mining to primarily underground mining where selectivity is key and we have a small footprint. These things will help us move from social resistance and concern to social acceptance and support by doing things such as minimising the amount of water consumption through recycling and minimising water discharge. We want to move away from tailings failures of about two per year to none in a human lifetime. We can do things such as minimising energy use and greenhouse gas emissions and move towards high capital efficiency and high flexibility mines. In conclusion, the integrated design process, which is focused on collaboration and interdisciplinary interaction, can help to improve mine economics, eco-efficiency and produce better, lower risk mines. By incorporating environmental factors into the mining method and process flow sheet decisions, we can come up with better overall system designs. It's important that we consider geology, geometry and geography to determine what is viable, what is the nature and the constraints of the deposits that allow us to come up with the most viable and lowest impact mining processing and waste management options. Tailings dewatering and mixing tailings with complementary rate wastes can reduce the risk of failures and water related conflicts. And the shift towards selective underground mining methods and pre-concentration can improve head grades, can reduce waste footprints and reduce water and energy use. And all of this really means we need to mine smarter, not bigger. I just wanna acknowledge these are some references for the various photos and, and inputs in the presentation. And if you have further questions or you'd like some more information, you can reach me here at my website. And that's the end of the presentation. I'll hand back to Bridget for questions. Yes, actually, uh, I think we do have a few questions. Nolene, uh, can you read them off to Laurie, please? Oh, sorry, one second. Uh, Nolene, <laughs> one moment, please. <laughs> She's on standby. Oh, she probably muted herself. Nolene, are you there? I am. But okay. Sorry about that. A, a quick reminder, if you have any questions, you can type them into the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. So um, we have a couple that have come in already. Um, first of all, Laurie, can you comment on how you design a mine um, and plan ahead for varying policies in the future? So an example was given um, that the allowable lead emissions in the US went down um, a factor of uh, 100 times resulting in the shutdown of a mine. So how do you design with that sort of buffer in mind? Okay, well, a lot of the principles that we talked about regarding eco-efficiency really produce lower risk mines where you're less susceptible to those regulatory changes. So in the case of the lead industry, things like fugitive emissions from dust or from tailings, those type of things, they're key challenges that you have to deal with. And the larger your mine, the, uh, the the greater its footprint, the greater the risks of those things. So I think from the outset, designing a mine where you've carefully considered all the risks and you've thought about a system to minimise footprints is important. Sometimes you have to think about ways to potentially contain contamination. Uh, if you can't, uh, for example, afford to put in uh, containment facilities straight away, well, think about how you might integrate those things in the future. But reducing the footprint, moving towards underground mining with backfill, those type of things will all reduce the quantities of waste and potentially allow you to, to concentrate potentially toxic waste into smaller repositories. There is always a risk though um, that the regulatory environment will change. You've just got to stay ahead of the game as much as you can. If you're operating to the limits of compliance, then chances are you're going to get yourself into trouble and you may be either shut down or face larger costs for environmental compliance as, as the mine proceeds. Okay. We have another question. Um, what challenges are involved when using salt water in replacement of fresh water? Okay, so as I said in the presentation, this can be quite commodity and process specific. So I'll talk about some examples from the copper industry. So in some deposits, we have copper associated with molybdenum. So in South America, for example, and you want to recover both the copper minerals and the molybdenum minerals. And copper floats okay in seawater, 
but molybdenite, the, the molybdenum, molybdenum mineral, uh, is susceptible to uh, changes in pH when you're trying to produce a, a nice clean copper concentrate in salt water, the molybdenum is also affected. So uh, you sometimes have to change reagents. There's a, a technology, for example, uh, that's called um, Air MBS. It's actually a barrack technology that uh, allows you to change the process chemistry and separate both the copper and the molybdenum successfully in seawater. Or alternatively, you can use high quality water in certain parts of the process where it's really needed to minimize the impact on losses from uh, certain certain species. In other cases, uh, you know, chlorides in in uh, solvent extraction, electro winning and electro winning processes, the chloride contamination can be a problem. So you want to try and target where do you use high quality water? Where can you get away with using low quality water? And the other thing with seawater is it's very corrosive. Make sure that you select the right materials in your processing stages that uh, your whole plant doesn't sort of corrode away within a couple of years because you didn't uh, think that through. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, what is your opinion on dry comminution processing? Based on okay. your experience, um, how, effective can that, how effectively can that be applied as in the cement industry? Yes, well, uh, you mentioned the cement industry. There's an enormous amount of cement that's ground through dry uh, comminution processes. It is quite efficient. There are challenges around uh, dust emissions, etc., but that, that can be managed. There are many cement plants in the world where that's managed very well. The key thing with dry comminution is what's going to happen in the separation afterwards. So if you have dry comminution and you have separation, dry separation, that, for example, allows pre-concentration, you reject some of the waste material in the ground material and you don't need water in subsequent stages, well, then that's going to help to reduce the overall water consumption. But if the comminution stage has to be followed by a wet separation stage, then uh, you still have to add the water. And so you get minimal benefit from that. But I think dry comminution certainly has potential in certain cases, and it's something that shouldn't be ruled out. Um, I think in the mining industry, we need to look at industrial examples of processes that are successfully done in other sectors and think about how they might fit into a system to reduce our overall water impact. And dry comminution is one of those potential technologies. Okay. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Um, there's a question saying, am I right that underground mining is more costly than open pit mining in terms of the overall cost? It depends on the deposit. And in general, the answer per tonne of ore is yes. And that's why underground mines tend to be higher grade because they have more value, so they're higher cost per tonne of ore and they're higher value per tonne of ore. And I think that the main thing that I'm trying to lead to is you have to look at the geology is and the geometry. Is the deposit suitable for an underground mining method? But I think if we focus on trying to find and mine deposits by underground methods wherever we can, we end up with projects that are lower environmental impact and potentially we can contain the costs on a per unit metal basis. So it can't apply for everywhere. For certain low grade disseminated deposits, you're just not going to be able to do underground mining at the costs you need to be economically viable. But in some cases, there are projects where you have a choice. For example, am I going to go open pit or am I going to go underground or am I going to do a transition from open pit to underground? And that's where we want to think about the possibility of more underground mining because it has less impact and what are the methods that best get the, the value because it's more about value as opposed to just cost. Especially, we don't want to focus so much on a cost on a dollars per tonne basis. It's really about the cost on a per unit of metal basis. Okay. Um, that's about all the time we have for questions at the moment. If you do have any further questions, um, there is Laurie's email on the screen right now. You, you can send him an email. Um, otherwise, we will have a survey going out uh, later and you can add your questions to that. Uh, so at this time, we just want to thank Laurie again for an interesting and informative presentation. Thank everyone for attending. Um, we hope that you can make it to the next webinar in our series, um, which will be on the 20th of September by David Cratishville of BQE Water. You can find out more information and register on the metsoc.org website. So thank you again, everybody. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.
Thanks.